computers will never behave the same way one minute yeah. to the next. True. Uh, well, okay. Thank you so much for, for, for the introduction. Uh, I really appreciated that on multiple levels. Um, it was very gracious of you. And thank you for the invitation uh, to, to this group of people. I'm, I'm very honored that you've chosen to spend your time uh, listening to, to my ramblings. What I want to share with you today are some ideas that have been wrapping around my head uh, that, that I think are developed enough that it wouldn't be wasting your time to, to share them. But you're the first, first group of people I'm sharing a semi-developed form of these ideas with. So I'm, I'm sharing it in the spirit of, uh, of looking for ideas and looking for feedback. Um, so if you, if you are inspired by this or frustrated by it or, or have some insight, I'd love to, love to hear, hear your take on it afterwards. So we're going to be talking about deception engineering which is uh, using deceptive techniques in your technology to make it harder for attackers to trust that they aren't tripping themselves up when they're moving through your, your network. And I'll go through that in a, in a bit more detail. Uh, so Vikas gave me a, a very nice introduction, which I appreciate. The, uh, so I'm, I'm really speaking to you more in the context of, from an ethical hacking perspective than my role as country manager of South Africa. That said, I am based in South Africa. If you want, uh, if you want any deep dive on any particular thing, we, are, uh, we can do that. Sorry, was that directed at me? Was that a, a rogue? No, no, Dominic, go ahead, please. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, so my context is, as, as Vicky Scandi pointed out, I joined uh, SensePost, which is a, a penetration testing organization, ethical hacking organization in 2010. And that's my, that's my history and my role. And I now oversee a group of, of ethical hackers. So it's still my, my area. And so we, basically what that means is we spend a lot of times hacking things and that gives us a little bit of an opportunity to say what we, which defenses we think work and work well. Or in the context of this talk, what I wanna share is why I think uh, some defenses are doomed to constant failure when they're up against real attackers what some of the fundamentals underpinning that are and how we can, how we can change that. My email address and, and, and uh, Twitter account are there if you want to get in contact. So Orange Cyber Defense sells a range of services. I'm not, I'm not here. Uh, sorry, I see something. Somebody's saying unable to hear you. Is everyone no. else able to hear me? We, we can hear Dominic. Go ahead, please. I think this okay. is so I, I'm not here uh, trying to sell you anything. I don't have any deception services that I can sell you after this. This isn't a veiled product pitch. This is some thinking as to specifically how you in your organization could look to build defenses that maybe invert some of the, the asymmetry you have where attackers always seem to win and defenders always seem to lose. Uh, that said, if you are interested in uh, working with, with people like me, uh, then please get in touch. Right, so the first question is, is why deception? And uh, I really just wanted to find an excuse to use this, this picture here. No, so that, that's, that's a joke. When the, the common perception, or the, at least the common refrain is, attackers always win, attackers only need to find one way in, and defenders need to defend everything. Uh, the most, well, it's, it's going out of favor now, but I used to love the analogy of Donald Trump's wall. You know, he wanted to spend $500 trillion or, or something of that amount to build this giant wall between Mexico and, and the USA, but it would be defeated with a $50 ladder that you could put over. So that's a very, very visceral feeling of the asymmetry that the attacker needs to only spend $50, the defender needs to spend $500. Now, there's an obvious analogy here to cybersecurity and what we spend our time doing. And the, the obvious next step, if we sort of looked at Trump's wall from the, the guise of cybersecurity is, well, now we need monitoring. We need a, a detection and response capability. So we're going to put cameras along the wall. We're going to hire a team of people to watch the cameras. We're going to need to hire people with guns to drive out there and shoo people away when they try and climb the wall with the ladder. So now a $500 trillion wall really? becomes a however many more trillion uh, dollar wall. And that's going to continue in perpetuity. Sure, you've built the wall and you need to maintain it with a flick of paint every now and again, but you're going to need to keep paying the cost of maintaining the cameras and maintaining people watching it. So it ends up being baked in to the way we 
secure things that the defenders always have to spend a lot more money and the attackers always have to spend a lot less because the other aspect of that $50 ladder is it can be reused and it can be reused against multiple walls. Whereas a defender can't copy paste a wall from one place to another. You have to rebuild a whole new wall at a whole new set of, of costs. But there's another way in which that asymmetry presents itself. And I'm, I'm going through this because it'll be interesting to say, well, how do we change that? So if you think about passwords, uh, if, if one of you volunteered to, for me to guess your password uh, and everybody else took bets on it, I mean, you're going to put your money on the volunteer because I'm not going to be able to guess their password. And then if you add a lockout you know, that I've only got three or five attempts, then I'm definitely not going to be able to guess that password within that time. On the flip side, if I don't need to guess your password, but I can guess anyone's password. So instead of saying, Vikas, your password is this, I say, do any of you here have this password? Well, then those odds start looking even better. But everyone here is a cybersecurity professional, so I'm sure you've got wonderfully strong passwords. It's even better odds if we can make that guess across your entire organization, which includes the people that run the canteen uh, who don't necessarily have specialist cybersecurity training. And then there's a very good chance that someone in that organization has a password of password one or summer 2020 or similar. So it's yet another way in which the, the odds are against the defender in that the, the attacks can be reused. Uh, the attacks have an infinite probability space. So when we look at uh, ways of trying to change the equation, we start looking at ways you can put costs on the attacker. Now, how do you make the big sumo wrestler there have a much harder time of it and give the, the little home alone guy, thanks for that, a little more punch? Well, then we start looking at things like, maybe we can, we can help Microsoft with takedowns. And you know, if we can actually arrest these people and take down their infrastructure, that makes a big difference. Now, we all know the complexity of dealing with law enforcement and the successes there in the cyberspace. So I'm not saying it's necessarily been successful, but even if we're doing that, you're increasing the costs against attackers but you're not inverting the equation. There's still an asymmetry. It just means that the sumo wrestlers may be a little skinnier and the little guys maybe got a, a lethal weapon somewhere, but it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to win. Not that I'm suggesting we're guaranteed to win, but if you, if you look at the, the underlying issue behind it, if we want to change the asymmetry, we need to change the fact that attackers have an infinite space of low cost probabilities while defenders have an infinite space of high cost realities. So an attacker just needs to find one way in, the defender needs to defend every way in. For the defender, it's high cost and you need to do it everywhere. For the attacker, it's low cost and you need to do it in one place. So inverting that asymmetry would mean, let's make it so the attackers have to worry about everywhere at a high cost and the defenders don't have to worry about everywhere and at a low cost. And that's, this is where I think deception can come in because if in the course of performing an attack, an attacker has to worry about everything. Could anything be a fake, a honeypot, a decoy that if you engage with is going to get your entire campaign burned down, then they have to worry about everything and the cost is high because their campaign's riding on it. And then from a defense point of view, you don't need to make sure that every single one of your machines is a honeypot. You just need to make sure that some are enough to put, keep the defender on their toes. And even if it means the defender has to do things much slower because they're carefully picking their way through the potential landmines that are buried there, that's also a win because then you're slowing the defender down to a cadence that maybe your team uh, would be better suited towards. So I think if we look at what some of those fundamentals are, then inverting the asymmetry is looking at how do we switch those probability spaces around. And that's what I want to get into a little bit today. Okay, so there's a great talk by, oh, jump too many slides, by a, a good friend of mine, Samuel Shah. Uh, he first presented at Hack in the Box in 2017 in Amsterdam, and uh, later as a keynote at Black Hat. And it was called Redefining Defense. I I'd highly recommend watching it. Uh, it's, it's specifically targeted for a group like this. Uh, and of course, he is one of the, the many Indian thought leaders in this group. And in, in that talk, he, he talked about his seven axioms of security, so ways in which you can redefine defense. One of the ones I really liked was 
axiom number six, which is that the best defense is a creative defense and that a creative defense is an unexpected defense. Now, from, a, from an attack point of view, that makes instant sense because as attackers, oh, some inception there, because as attackers, a lot of the time we know what defenses are in place and we get to practice before we get there. So if we think of Trump's wall, it's we've got the ladder because we know we're going up against a wall and we know the ladder worked on the last wall so we can use it on this one. Now, in the cyber world, we don't have a ladder, we have attack toolkits. That could be everything from C2s to Active Directory Lateral Movement and Privilege Escalation toolkits. But those toolkits work because they work everywhere else. We can practice, we can refine them. Even something like antivirus, you get to practice against that. I can download whatever EDR or AV if we've managed to fingerprint it and then make sure our, our uh, toolkit is, is fudded, fully undetectable before we get into an engagement. So we can practice before that happens. So now the second the defenses are unexpected, which means you look different or creative, then that gets very difficult for us. But of course, as a defender, you go, well, you know, I, this is a scarce skill area. These are expensive resources, not just from a people perspective, but from a tooling perspective. Now you're asking me to invent new controls that nobody else is using. The risk on my organization is very high uh, if that doesn't work. Plus, it's going to require a lot of work. And what I think is that deception technologies can, can help us with that because they aren't a lot of work. They're small and cheap. Uh, and they, they end up creating this unexpected defense. But first, I want to cover why I think the basics end up having, having problems. Because again, it goes into where have we gotten the, it wrong so that the asymmetry is against us. And when I say us, I'm meaning defenders here. I know I keep switching my hats. Uh, so the, the first example is, I, I want to go through four examples quickly. Passwords, patching, antivirus, and, and common controls generally. And we know it. if you just do the basics right, there'd be no problems. This is what people keep telling us. Every time you get a pen test report, one of us smarmily writes, please apply the patches uh, as if that's going to, to fix things. And there's this idea that the basics are a set of preventative controls that if everybody just did, things would be much better. But let's look at that in reality. So let's take the patch treadmill. You're expected to not only patch all your servers, but all of your client side software. They'd, all have different release times. You've got the potential of emergency releases. I'm sure many of you are dealing with the NSA's exchange patches that uh, came out recently. So to be patched all of the time against all of the things, this is possible. So we know that a reasonable patching metric is if you're getting above 70%. If you're doing 80%, you're doing well. If you're hitting 90%, you're, you're world class. But if you think about that, if 90% of your servers are patched against uh, all the latest security vulnerabilities, then you're probably world class. But putting on the attacker hat, the whole point of hacking is not you run a magic tool and you're in. A large part of hacking is doing reconnaissance. Most attacking toolkit is about reconnaissance. If you look at the bug bounty communities at the moment, every new tool they release is another reconnaissance tool. Because the one thing attackers are very good at is finding vulnerabilities. And they know that they aren't just going to present themselves, that you have to look for them. So it's a, it's a matter of scale. So if you take where attackers are excellent at, which is reconnaissance to find vulnerabilities, and you take an excellent patch management routine at 90% coverage, well, then by definition, the attacker is going to get in because 90, 10 out of 100 servers not being patched is good enough for an attacker. Again, that's probably, probably better. So our assumption that patching is even a reasonable defense is wrong. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying don't patch. I'm saying the idea that you can get to 100% and that that's a meaningful defense uh, is what's broken here. Let's take mm. antivirus. So if you look at antivirus and EDR, I think EDRs, there's a, there's a detection element with a blue team. So let's just keep it specifically to antivirus and antivirus-like things. They're trying to detect malware either on disk or, or in memory. If I put a rough metric on it, antivirus stops about 80% of what's out there. Now, that's not a, that's not a scientific metric. That's a bit of a um, what's the Pareto principle, 80-20. But we also know that trying to deploy antivirus across your, your whole estate, particularly if you have a large estate, people are working from home, their bandwidth isn't working, they're not connecting to the VPNs. If you can get 80% deployment across your estate, you're also doing quite well. Now, what we forget is that 80% of 80% is 
So antivirus isn't giving you 80% coverage, it's giving you 20, 26% coverage. Now, again, I may be being too precise on my stats for made up numbers. Uh, so it's much like patching, you've got quite a big hole that you can, you can target. But then if you look at the actual costs of bypassing antivirus, now most security teams will maintain their own crypto toolkits, tools that will help you to bypass antivirus. But this is an example of a public one. You know, if you Google it, it's the first one out there. And some of you may be aware, but maybe not everyone, that cryptos are a service that the, the dark web sells. So a one month license means that for that month, you will be entitled to get updates that will allow you to continue bypassing all of the antivirus. So it's a subscription service. For a year at $74 and a, a lifetime license at $150, they're basically saying within the cat and mouse game of trying to bypass antivirus, they'll keep you probably not at the top, but somewhere near the, the middle. And that means known malware can be uh, obfuscated in such a way that antivirus doesn't, doesn't detect it. Now, there's a ton of nuance there, depending what activity you're doing in memory uh, versus on disk makes a difference. But that, that, 30, that 26 percent of availability starts from a possibility space that looks much bigger because you can literally go buy this toolkit uh, to do it. And while you can say, you know, the McAfee is $15 for a home edition, I'm not sure what seat licenses are for big organizations in India. Uh, and this is only $50 for a one-year license. You can say, well, the, the antivirus is cheaper. But of course, the, the crypto is the ladder and the antivirus is the wall, well, is the brick. So you need to get antivirus for your entire organization. Uh, and then those, that asymmetry starts to show up. So antivirus has not been the preventative control that we think it is. It's potentially a detective control, but we'll get to that. All right, then we've got common controls. Now that could be passwords. Oops, sorry. I've broken something. Okay, I'm not sure why that's happening. Uh, that could be passwords. That could be your Active Directory rollout, all of the kinds of things that people recommend as the common controls that you should use. So I like this analogy. We know that the TSA put these locks on the bags so that when we go to America, they can open and rifle through our underwear, uh, but then technically the baggage handlers within our local airports can't get into rifle through our underwear. So only the TSA can look at our underpants. Uh, now this, this is an okay control, it made sense until somebody proudly showed the TSA keys on television. And then some enterprising hackers just uh, made 3D, 3D CAD drawings of them. And now you can 3D print your own TSA keys. And so the, the problem here is this, a common control, once it failed, because it was commonly deployed everywhere, created a common vulnerability. And now if we take it away from that hypothetically is not around TSA to cyber, passwords are exactly that. For years, the recommendation was apply complexity requirements and length isn't as important. And that ended up creating the vulnerability because users started choosing passwords that looked similar. So that's where you got password one and summer 20 and corona 2020 or COVID-19 as passwords because the complexity requirements forced people into those. Having to change it each month means you're incrementing numbers on the end to make it easy. And there's an uppercase or lowercase in a number means that becomes a common combination of what you do. But then we're all in security. So we all heard that NIST updated their guidelines to say length over complexity. It's not uh, the, the old way of doing it is wrong. Except to this day, audit teams at audit firms will still punish security organizations for taking that approach. You end up having to defend audit findings to the board uh, while having a conversation going, but NIST has updated this guidance. So the, the control has been embedded in how we do things. And it takes much longer to, to turn that ship uh, than, than we would like. And so that's just another example of the asymmetry that gets baked in because the attacker can keep trying different passwords and the defender has to keep looking that everybody's got, got the right password. And there's lots of other places. So Active Directory is a great example of that. At one point, Active Directory provided a wonderful single sign-on centralized identity solution. But now its complexity is so high and its understanding of that complexity by the attackers is so good that it's, it's almost actively a vulnerability, but removing it from our networks, which have now been built around it is incredibly difficult. There's a reason why something like Mimikatz is so popular. It's because they understand secrets management within Windows machines and Active Directory better than Microsoft does in some cases. 
It's why they got uh, Benjamin Deffy, probably mispronounced his name in French, to present at Blue Hat. And so you've got this asymmetry continuing, even though you've got the basic. And then, of course, lastly, even when there are good defenses, they atrophy over time. So Active Directory is just an example of that. But any defense that you put in place, which becomes popular. So if a vendor comes along, they've got a fantastic defense, and then it gets rolled out everywhere. Well, attackers then need to figure out the bypasses to that. So if you look at internet banking, in the early days, an OTP was a wonderful defense against the kind of phishing attacks that you got with internet banking. Now, 2FA bypasses are a part of your standard scanners toolkit. They're not particularly sophisticated. So popular defenses atrophy even faster and because they can be reused against victims of malware. Okay, so I've gone on a lot about that. So what about detection? So now I'm not talking about deception here, I'm talking about detection. And the, we've got this fetish within cyber, well, more information security that detective controls are what we need to, to put in place. So the example is patching and antivirus. Those are all the basics, they're preventative controls that can be put in place. And when it comes to detection, we've got this idea that on the one hand, detection must be audit requirement driven. Uh, some poor business owner gets a printout once a month of all of the uh, new accounts that have been authorized on a particular system, and they're expected to review it and sign it off. And you've got these people who've been sitting there for 10 years that get this blooming printout once a month that they're supposed to review and sign. And then once a year, every three or four years, the auditor comes along and checks that they've signed the stack of papers. You know, that's not an effective detected control, but it's built into the system, we're doing it. Then on the other hand, we've got this idea that you need an expensive blue team. You need 20 of the world's greatest detection engineers. You need a very expensive seam. You need all of the EDR tooling. You need to be backed by a threat intelligence company and it turns to an awful lot of money. Now, I'm not saying these two things aren't useful, but we've got this weird dichotomy where it's one or the other, but very rarely the middle. And so where I think deception can do is it can provide us an ability to, to, to change how we're doing alerting. So if you, if you take an example of something like antivirus, I've, I've talked about the problems with, with antivirus, but antivirus can provide some incredibly useful detection. From an attack point of view, if somebody is monitoring for when we disable an antivirus engine, that is a very high quality alert because that's the first thing we're going to do. It, it's not about bypassing EDR a lot of the time, if you can turn the EDR off or firewall off the alerts getting through to the, the central console, those are also reasonable ways of blinding the EDR so that it isn't sending those, those things through. So lack of reporting, something stopped reporting, there's a problem with the agent, those become interesting alerts. And then many years ago, it was around 2007, Hack in a Box, two Russian guys did a talk, I can't remember the name, but they talked about antivirus being a very useful indicator of when you've messed up. Now they used more colorful language uh, for messed up, but I'm not gonna repeat that here. And what they said is if you can retain the, the payloads either in memory or that execute on disk and scan them over time, eventually something will trigger because bypassing antivirus in the short time is very easy, but in the long term is not as easy. Now the problem with these ideas, it, it, I mean, I think they're great ideas and they, they should be employed, but you end up with an alert problem. Uh, if you take the example of a car dashboard, your car doesn't give you a log file with a thousand entries. It puts on an engine warning light and it keeps it persistent. The difference between input into a problem and a definitive uh, alert that there is a problem uh, is very large. And I know many of you deal with that. So what we end up doing is we, we, we've got this idea, and I'm sure many of you don't, but I've certainly seen it a lot, that the quality of an alert is additive. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have something that sends you 100 alerts in a, in a day. And when there's an attack, one of those is useful. Now, I think that's, that's pretty good, one out of 100 uh, for some of the tooling that we've seen. You take uh, historically IDSs, one in 100 is actually doing pretty well. But, so, but let's just make it hypothetical. If one, in, one out of 100 alerts are not false positives, we're sitting at 1%. But the belief is if we add another tool, which also gives us one in 100% at 1%, then we add them together and now we've got a 2% detection. And if we have enough of those collectively, we can get some high percentage of detection. Now, again, I'm making up percentages, but just to give an example. But the reality is that 
the quality of an alert is not additive. You can't add them together. If I have one utility, which gives me one in 100 um, useful alerts, and another utility, which gives me one in 100 alerts, well, then in total, I get two in 200 useful alerts, which is still 1%. So it's not additive in, in that way. So what we need is low volume, low false positive alerting. That then can be a very useful part of the basics that could probably move things forward uh, in, a, in a more interesting way than trying to move from 70% patch compliance to 90% patch compliance. Uh, and again, I'm not saying do one or the other, but people tend to leave deception for right at the end. It's no, do all of the basics first and then move on to, sorry, detection, not deception. So I think low volume, low false positive alerts should absolutely be part of the, the basics toolkit. And this is where it brings me to deception. I know we're a little while in here, halfway into the talk, I'm now finally talking about deception, but I needed to, to give you my justification. So deception is, is how I think we can invert the asymmetry. It, it inverts the asymmetry because it costs more for the attacker than for you to maintain. So using the wall analogy, you need to paint it regularly, but you also need to pay the people who are watching the cameras and keep the trucks ready to, to roll to go and arrest someone climbing the wall or whatever they had in mind. Uh, similarly, you've got to keep a blue team watching. You've got to keep a response team or a forensics team ready to, to jump. Uh, and then you've also got to maintain all of these controls with your annual licensing costs and things like that. So for the most part, defense costs you more than it costs the attacker. So by inverting the asymmetry, let's take stuff that costs the attacker more than it costs you. Uh, I also think deception can, can by its nature be creative and unexpected, partly because it's not popular yet. Even though it's been talked about for decades within security, it's predominantly been spoken about as a research initiative. It's something that can help you to understand attackers when you're researching it, but not something that um, you can use in meaningful defense. And because it's cheap, you can keep moving them around. It's not a static defense with something like a firewall or antivirus. And by its nature, the alerts are high quality or higher quality. You can absolutely have bad quality alerts from deception, but at a simplistic level, if you've got a honeypot that nobody should be touching, if anybody touches it, you've got a high quality alert that someone, someone is there. So what do, I, what do I mean by deception? This is by no means a complete list. I just quite like hacking articles.ions uh, uh, icons here. You can put deception in everywhere. People have this idea that honeypots, you know, things sitting on the network responding to, to packets are, are what deception is but that's not it. Deception can be anywhere. As a matter of fact, the, the space is arguably infinite in much the same way that an attacker's opportunity for attack is arguably infinite. You can, at a high level, talk about the tech stack. You know, we're, here we're talking about databases and email and web applications and, and networks. But even if you go into the detail, which I'm gonna do in a little bit, there's, there's an almost infinite space. At a database level, are you, the whole database could be a honeypot, or it could be specific tables within that database that if anyone queries, um, you, you highlight on. Or it could be files with connection strings sitting on a file server somewhere or on a web server as decoys. There's, if you think about a specific item, there's so many places you could put deception in. In the same way, an attacker has a near infinite number of ways to manipulate Windows PE executables uh, to embed malware in, in different so malware honeypots are where you're trying to get attackers to infect something so you can look at their malware. Database honeypots would be a fake database. Spam honeypots are maybe fake addresses where if you receive any spam on that address, you then blacklist the, the sender. Email honeypots might be email servers, you know, exchange servers out there where you're trying to catch um, early attempts at people exploiting some exchange vulnerability. Spider honeypots are looking at your web applications. Can you put certain URLs in place uh, in robots.txt where you say no one should go here. If anyone goes there, you auto blacklist that, that IP address. Honey nets are uh, networks that, that effectively there's nothing at. And if any packets go there, you end up blacklisting those. That's been something that's been used for a long time. Dark nets, they used to be called. Open. And then of course, there's more than what's here. There's honey, honey tokens. Can you embed uh, encrypted passwords in memory on Windows machines such that an, an attacker uses Mimikatz and uses one of those, you then have an, an early alert. Uh, can you put files that when opened alert 
on on certain things. I mean, the the probability space to to put some deception in is infinite. And so it's kind of hard to pin down deception. When you look, there's, there'll, there'll be a lot of definitions around high interaction honeypots, low interaction honeypots. Uh, they'll switch between, are you doing it for research? Are you doing it for alerting? It's a lot of different things. But the point I want you to understand for the slide is there's a lot. The area where I'm quite interested in, I, there's probably a decent name for it, a working title I'm giving them is honey triggers, which would be bad actions performed on servers under your control. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, there's a, there's a wonderful company called Thinkst, which sell deception technology. They have canaries, which are their, their network honeypots, and they have canary tokens, which are a variety of files or URLs or DNS entries that can trigger if these things are used. And uh, they actually used to work at SensePost. I, I couldn't see who signed your, um, your certificate there, uh, because, but it might have even been one of Harun or, or Marco. And they presented a talk at Black Hat 2015 called Bring Back the Honeypots, where they, they put in a really nice justification for why they think honeypots should be used. I'd encourage you to, to look at it. Uh, they deal with a lot of the standard um, responses, like doesn't this increase more uh, our vulnerability? Is this something that should be done later? But one of the slides that they put up is, or one of the concepts that they talked about was, how do you put honeypots on your network or honey deception things in your network in such a way that uh, attackers can actually find it. If from a, a density point of view, if you only have one honeypot in 10,000 servers, what are the chances the attacker is actually going to trip over that thing? Sure, if they're doing a network-wide scan, they might trip over it. But if they're doing more targeted scanning, then they, they might not. So it's worthwhile thinking, what's a, what's a reasonable level of density? And then orthogonal to that is the idea of references. So instead of putting enough of these things in place that an attack is going to trip over them, you can put references to them in place. So one of their suggestions was in the recent, recently viewed files on Windows machines across your domain, you include a reference to a SMB server that is actually a honeypot. So if an attacker has now compromised a user's machine looking at recently accessed files, that's one of the things they're going to trip over. But there might be more technical ways that you could embed references. So you sort of have this choice. You either have more references to fewer honeypots, or you have more honeypots uh, with less references, or a bit of both. But part of the problem that you run into is you, you want to make sure that the false positives are low. So you want to make sure that you don't have such high density that some of these, that machines just end up tripping over these things because they're on every user subnet. And every time somebody runs something that scans the rest of the network with UDP broadcasts, it's going to get triggered. Uh, and on the flip side, you don't want the references all over the place such that your average user might trip over it. Oh, what's this in my recent files? They click on it. Uh, and so I'm stealing something else from, from Salmil's talk, uh, where he introduced this concept of Nakatomi space, which I think is an incredibly useful concept. So Salmil himself actually borrowed it from, from a guy who wrote a blog entry, an architectural blog entry. Uh, talking about Nakatomi space. I'll explain what it is in a moment. And then someone applied it to, to cyberspace. So I like thinking of the difference as Hakatomi space versus Nakatomi space. So this is a reference to Nakatomi Plaza from Die Hard, one of the greatest movies ever made uh, for Christmas. And uh, in it, Bruce Willis moves through the, the Nakatomi building any way that's possible, except using the hallways and the corridors and the way the architecture was actually built. And uh, what the original author uh, was talking about is he was talking about as an architectural principle. And he was even referring to somebody else, a guy named I.L. Wiseman, who was complaining about the way the Israel army had behaved uh, in a particular engagement. And what they had done is they moved through the city by blowing up walls, by going through ceilings. So that if you were viewing from above with a satellite, you actually wouldn't see the troops moving through the city because they're using all of the internal spaces between buildings. Now, this analogy applies very nicely for cyber because a lot of the time with hacking, you're moving through the parts of networks or computer systems or applications that nobody ever expected a user to be, to be interacting with. How am I doing on time here? Sorry, 42 minutes. Uh, so the, one of the ideas is where, where can you put your, um, 
your deception techniques in such a way that your users aren't actually going to trip over it and it's not necessarily going to get in the way. And the idea would put it in, in hackatomy space, the places that attackers end up moving. So that could be backend APIs. Uh, for example, we've done a lot of work against Swift environments of, of late. And the second you manage to get to the backend MQ servers, you can move between networks, systems, environments, and applications outside of the way a network's actually meant to move. You're now moving through the network of MQs and pipes rather than the network, the TCP IP network. And a lot of the time that's unexpected. What we found over the years is that people weren't putting passwords on their MQ servers. That's slowly changing as Swift drives some of their CSP requirements. But it's a classic example of moving around on the back end or within the, the, the hackatomy space rather than moving in the front. And the second thing that I think might be quite useful in figuring out where to put your deception is uh, some work was done by a guy named Ollie Whitehouse, who's long uh, one of the, the hacker OGs. And uh, you can see this is from March 2021. He's also doing some similar work around deception engineering. And what he did is he aligned some of the, the techniques to known TTPs from malware. So in this example, he used Raya, probably mispronouncing that, uh, looked at its, its TTP, and he created a service that looks like one of the services that the Raya malware would trigger on. And if that service gets killed, well, then it hibernates the host and it sends an alert out to, to indicate that that thing is on there. So it's an example of running something in Hackatomi space that is oriented around known TTPs that, that malicious people would use. Now, of course, you could also build detection and alerting around that TTP on there. Uh, but one of those is a big top-down project. This is a lighter weight uh, bottom-up project. Plus, the code to do this is small and simple. And I'll show you, uh, show you in a moment. So if I, I've mentioned a couple of times that I think the, the probability space here is, is near infinite. So if you think about a traditional tech stack, the management utilities, the network, hosts on the network, back ends, front ends, each one of those presents a high level category underneath it, several high level categories that could present a, a whole possible space of where you can put um, where you can put deception techniques in there. So instead of thinking in terms of tech stacks where to put this, rather I thought, well, let's let's think in terms of requirements. Oops, skip the slide. So what are the requirements we want to see from? Oh, got to get my blinky server lights on. So I think a uh, a deception technique needs to be something that you can deploy quickly. The corollary being that's something that you can undeploy uh, if it's not working or if you want to change things up. It needs to be simple. We don't want to add more complexity to an, into an environment. We want people to be able to get their heads around it quickly and to understand it. Easy to maintain, obviously. You don't want to be uh, failing to invert the asymmetry because you've now got all of this deception stuff that you need to, to maintain. It needs to be unobtrusive, so it doesn't get in the way of users when you're uh, in doing their usual stuff. So on the one hand, that it's not creating false positives, but on the other hand, that it isn't slowing them down or getting in their way in, in a way that many people have complained about from an obtrusive perspective. Mahesh, I have seen your question. I'll hope to get to it. And then lastly, it needs to trigger on bad behavior, not trigger on every behavior, because then it just becomes a, a bad way of logging. You know, there's other ways to get logs already. Let's not use a canary or a, a honey token to do that. So let's get into a practical example. Now, like I said, there's, there's a lot of different places that you could, you could do this. So I'm going to give you one example, which is an area I'm, I'm actively working in at the moment. So if we think about containers, and I chose containers partly because uh, it's something we've been working on with some clients, but also because there are so many great high quality pictures of container ships ever since the ever given block of Suez Canal. Um, so this is one of the, the pictures here. So if you think about containers, they're small, uh, specific execution environments used as part of a whole. With kind of Kubernetes, you've got this concept of a pod, which is a set of containers that support running a particular service. That could be a web application. Uh, it could be something, something smaller. So the hackatomy space within containers is, is general command execution. Technically, with containers, you want to define what it does, send it off to run, and then nobody should be connecting into those containers and running commands other than the ones that are, are defined. It gives you a nice security uh, activity boundary. And then if we think about the stack specific to containers, 
we've got almost the full Linux execution environment. We've got the kernel, the container orchestration on running the linker. So from a Linux perspective, the thing that links in the libraries, you've got the libraries themselves, Windows OB DLLs and Linux.SOs. You've got whatever's actually running the thing. So this is before it gets to the kernel executing it, the, how things are run in the shell. And then you've got things sitting at the, the file system. That's sort of just off the top of my head. There's a, there's a bunch of places that you can start to embed deception triggers. And this is where I was talking about honey triggers. Over and above all of the other standard, well-defined well honey pots, uh, honey nets, honey tokens that are out there. So there's a project that I'm working on, uh, I've called it yellow. And because if you add the blue team, then it makes green, which is a reference to the, the Thinks stuff, Thinks Canary, who uh, a lot of these ideas are theirs and their technology underpins this. So what I was trying to do with yellow is create simple binary modifications that trigger a DNS canary token when a binary is executed inappropriately. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I've got, I've got three at the moment. There's another three that I'm working on that I haven't taken, taken public yet. Uh, so you can go right now to canarytokens.org and you can create a DNS token. They're free. Uh, very useful. There's a bunch of different different tokens. If you have their commercial service, which I have no affiliation to, other than they're friends of mine, I think the technology is good. Then you can also create mass canary tokens for deployment across your your network in other interesting ways. But this is a free service that they offer. So I've created one of these, and then I, you know I've made the mistake of putting code on a slide. I'm not expecting you to read this code, but this is the the near full code required to to do the thing that I'm, I'm showing you. In total, it's 28 lines of actual code, ignoring comments. There's a, a header file where this does put in. So in terms of those requirements, I was saying, this is simple, this is maintainable. Uh, it's not a, a big complex, complex thing. And then here is the, the full Docker file that uh, not only builds the, the tool, but actually deploys it into a container. So the top part is the builder and the bottom part is the, the deployment. Again. The point here is not to show you the details of a Docker file, but rather to say simple, maintainable, easy to deploy is, is what we're looking at. And, you know, if you compare this to needing to roll antivirus out uh, across an organization, this is something that somebody could do potentially in an afternoon after you've gotten change control sign off. So what does it look like? Well, it's rather unspectacular. So here is a container. Let's say I've managed to hack in somewhere. Uh, I've got command execution on an underlying host. Let's say it's a web application that has uh, some kind of command execution vulnerability in it. And now when I run ID, it runs as normal. On the back end with the simplest one, uh, ID is actually linked to our binary called yellow, which then invokes the real ID. So yellow is a wrapper which invokes the real one. Now this of course is very easy to detect for an attacker. They could write uh, run ls-l, see that it's a symlink, or all sorts of other techniques see that it's a symlink. So I've got currently public two other techniques. One uh, as a shared library, which, which does the same thing, invokes it. And the other, which does it actually within the linker, uh, which is probably the most stealthy. stealthy Appreciate it. Uh, so when, when an attacker runs ID, then I get an alert on my phone, a canary mail, a canary token was triggered on my, my phone. That's what the alert looks like. And I can go to the website and it gives me the location uh, the IP came from. And it tells me in the generic data field that a canary exe uh, was run. Now you can create different canary tokens for different hosts or different groups of hosts. Um, that's easier to do with the enterprise version than with the, the free version. Uh, and you can embed these in different ways. It can execute on all of the commands. If you've got a container, you know, all but one, there's a container which does some one thing very simply like runs nginx. Uh, or it can, it can alert on very specific hacker tools. Uh, and there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. The three examples that I currently have on that GitHub repository are, are simple examples of showing that the, much like malware has an ability to execute almost anywhere, you can embed these deception techniques almost anywhere. OK, so let me, let me start wrapping up. So the, the, the three conclusions I really want to, to leave you with. The first is that high quality detection should be part of the basics. 
Uh, and by high quality, I mean low false positive, low volume. So it's not something where you necessarily need the full blue team. It is something where the overworked IT manager could meaningfully get an alert on their phone uh, and react to a little bit like the engine light within a car. That uh, ignoring deception, focusing on the problem of asymmetry, and then looking at ways in which you can invert that asymmetry is a meaningful thing to do. Asking yourself the question, um, asking yourself the question of a, is this something that can, sorry, I was just seeing your question because, is this something that can be used, that, that's gonna cost me more to run than an attacker to run? Is it gonna cost me more to run at scale than an attacker runs? It's probably often yes, but if you can switch it around uh, with something like deception, that's great. And then deception avoids many of the traditional pitfalls. The takeaway here, the real takeaway is, I think if you engage in this idea within your organization, you could probably put a ton of deceptive controls around your organization for cheap. In this, by cheap, I mean from a time perspective uh, and from a, a cost perspective in terms of how much it's going to cost you to roll it out. That will make things significantly harder for attackers because as an attacker, you then can't trust anything that you're seeing. You can't scan the network without worrying about tripping over something. You can't execute commands on a host without worrying about tripping over something. Uh, that becomes... As an attacker, you're significantly slowed down, and there's a high chance of getting getting caught. Okay, so that's the that's the the talk. I'm sorry, I'm trying to uh, fit it within the hour here. So there was one question. Okay, so the, there was one question which was uh, from Mahesh. She said, "Gartner still says seven ten out of breaches happen internally. So how do we detect, prevent, and block?" I I think. That's kind of the idea here is uh, is about detection. This is not a um, this is not specific to external or internal. I think any threat actors, be they external or internal, uh, could potentially be tripped up by this. Plus, attackers start off external, but they end up internal. When we are attacking, we want to emulate real users as quickly as possible so that we move out of hackatomy space um, into the normal space. Uh, Okay, um, Vikas, can I, I hand it over to you for, I, I'm not sure what the usual process is here. Right, so uh, great talk, Dominic. I'm sure everybody would have enjoyed. So we can open for Q&A. So guys, if you have any, any question, you can unmute yourself and ask question. And you can type on the chat as well. But we would prefer you turn on your cam, turn on your mic and ask the question. No question. So let, let you have, have any insults. Let, let me ask one question. What, what I always fascinate is, so traditional attack starts with a phishing, right? Somebody clicks on a link and attacker gets a remote shell. Now, after getting an initial remote shell, now you are just piggybacking on the actual user, right? You are not tripping the uh, the canaries were not tripping the deception applied by the organization by your own. What I'm saying is you are, you got initial access to the box and then you were just waiting and watching where that user is going. If that user is going to a, to a, to a, uh, you know, legitimate SQL server, legitimate web server, legitimate file server, that's where you are going. You are not trying to map the internal network by running different commands, which can trip you over, right? How do you handle that kind of scenario with deception? So attacker is smart over here, right? He's not tripping anything. He's just waiting and watching the connections where the user is going. So how does deception plays in that case? So, you know, I posed that exact question to, to somebody like Haroon from Things before. And that's, if you have deception tech deployed all over the place, then that's what you're forced to do as an attacker. So in the first part, it's a win because it means that an attacker can't just run all over the place. We've certainly seen numerous environments where we don't have to worry about detection. We don't have to worry about tripping things over. You can go loud and proud. You can run Nessus on their internal network because there's no chance that anyone's going to, um, to pick you up. So the fact that you have to now slowly watch a user and wait is already a bit of a win. You're slowing things down. The next part of that is, you know, if you're going after the application that the user is using, then a lot of the time you can do that, and it's, it's quite, quite sad. But as an attacker, 
you want to try and get access to uh, the command and control. And when I say command and control, I don't mean from a malware perspective. I mean the command and control from an IT management perspective. You're looking to get access to the Active Directory and administrative accounts and things like that. So at some point, you need to do a privesc, uh, privilege escalation. At some point, you do want to move laterally across that network. Because even if I have access to that one person's host, what's the thing that's going to give me access to the next person's host? So on that person's machine, I might root around looking for, for credentials. Hypothetically, if there's a file there marked passwords.docx, depending on how paranoid you are. But most of the time as an attacker, you don't have to worry about honeypots. You're probably going to open it uh, to look for it. If you align the kinds of things on people's hosts to attack a TTPs, then you've got a higher chance of, of getting it. And that's the references versus the um, density thing. Uh, yeah, so the that I think that answers your question a little bit. Yep. The yep. other side of it is it's imperfect. But because these are small things, you can put a lot of them there and hope that some of them trigger some of the time rather than needing something that's going to be 100% all the time, which is what the patching and antivirus world wants us to do. Yep, makes sense. Thanks. So, hi. Yeah. Hi, this is Malika. Malika, I just like to ask any technology which is implemented, initially it would be smart again. When it is implemented and it is put into use, it will become normal. My question is whether this deception can outsmart the smart attacker on a continuous basis. And second question is what uh, user awareness we can provide wherein uh, we install these uh, deception, uh, whatever files are there, decoys on end user nodes. What awareness or education we can give it to them? Okay, so the, the first part of that, I, I fully agree with that, pop, that controls tend to atrophy over time. At the point that I made on that one slide is, is I think the same thing that you're saying there. When it becomes popular, it then becomes less smart uh, as time goes. So how do we keep up with the attackers? Well, I think the idea here is that this is very cheap and easy to do. Taking canary tokens and putting them around your network uh, becomes an, the effort of an afternoon, not a month long security technology deployment process. And so if you have a sprint every other quarter to put a couple of these in place, collectively over time, you're building up quite a significant portion of these. But an attacker, even if they're coming back, doesn't know that those things haven't changed. You can also stop doing some things and put in others. That's why, for example, with yellow, I've got three different ways that you can do the same thing. You could use one technique and not another. You could use all three techniques. Switching them becomes quite easy. And then if you've got some security engineering capability, writing new ones isn't, isn't too difficult. Something like putting a, 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 a URL on your website that if anyone hits, Gets, gets blacklisted. That's not, that doesn't require significant security engineering functionality. That can be done a little simpler. So you have an ability to move quite quickly, to change a lot and to put them in different places to keep ahead of the threat. From a user awareness perspective, hopefully users don't know about this. This isn't putting things in their way. This is something that an attacker who isn't in a user doesn't know that they shouldn't be tripping up. And a user in the performance of their normal activity shouldn't be, be tripping up. So hopefully there's there's no user awareness required. Great, thanks, Dominic. I think there are a couple of more questions. So maybe we can take one last question from Mr. Anand. So Mr. Anand, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Mr. Anand Agarwal. Yeah, hi. Hi, thanks, Vikas. Uh, so basically, see, uh, uh, Dominic, when we talk about deception, uh, this thing, we talk about deploying the various decoys in the multiple VLANs, as I say. Now, I mean, how do you decide that? Uh, uh, how many? Did, I mean, let's say there are servers. Let's say something. Some. Let's say I have. Let's say I have some two thousand endpoints. Okay, I have some servers on multiple VLANs, or I maybe have a Active Directory on more than one VLAN. How do you decide which, uh, how many decoys to deploy it in, in a particular VLAN? And how do I measure the success of this uh, deployment of this technology? So I think that goes back to that references versus density um, thing we spoke about earlier that the things spoke about. So on the one hand, the answer is 
just one because an attacker on your network doesn't necessarily know which subnet is good. And if they're having to do from the beginning reconnaissance, well, then they're going to trip up that just one, you know, if you're scanning entire subnets. And we've certainly done that in engagements. When we're under time pressure and we don't think there's any detection, you just scan the network. Then how do you measure if it's successful? Well, is it detecting anything ever? Does it detect your pen testers when they come in? Does it detect real attackers? Now, of course, if you had more of those, if you had one per VLAN, then that's going to give you a higher chance of, of detection. It might give you some higher overhead in terms of other scanners legitimately tripping it over. Uh, but the, the, then it becomes a bit of a cost thing. You know, I think depending on how many VLANs you have and the size of your organization, there is a cost to buying something like a Thinks Canary uh, or running your own honeypot in there. So that, that's probably going to be moderated by, by cost. But I think you can make up for that with things like canary tokens or honey tokens or things like honey triggers, which are much smaller, much cheaper. You know, canary doesn't charge per, per canary token that you deploy. They charge per uh, bird as they call it or canary, but they don't charge for the honey tokens. And those you can, you can blacken the sky with. Your network can be, be covered in those on, on file servers. Uh, they can be put in code repositories. And then with these kinds of honey triggers, you can put them in actual execution on the host to make up for maybe a lack of density uh, on, the, on the network level, or in addition to I don't know if that answers your question. Yep, thank you. Great, Dominic, sounds good. So we are over time. Let me make just a couple of closing remarks. So uh, we have 130, 334 participants today, and only one person joined for the very first time. Right. So we have been running these webinars since March. And that's great, Manish, that you joined today. So I will I will run through in terms of closure what, what we do at the end of the webinar. So if you are not part of Elite CISO WhatsApp group, what you can do is you can go to the website, go to the membership and apply for the membership over here. And membership is for corporate CIOs and CISOs only. So if you're a corporate CIO or CISO, you can go ahead and register and you are already part of it. So that's fine. Um, and then if you want to download the participation certificate for this session, you can go to again, uh, Elite CISO website, go to events, go under upcoming events and click on CPE certificate. This will take you to another page, which will require your email address, your full name and a password to download the certificate. So the password to download certificate is D-E-C-E-P-T-I-O-N, deception. I am putting it on the chat as well. So to download the certificate, the answer is deception, okay? All small cases, D is not capital, nothing is capital in this. Every time I see people making a mistake of putting it either in full capital or first letter capital. So it is all small case deception, okay guys? So uh, that's how you can get your certificate. And as, as I say that, okay, every week we do, we do these webinars. So next week on 22nd April, we are getting Dr. Mansoor Hasim who is phenomenal cyber professional. He has written multiple books around cybersecurity leadership. But this talk is going to be about the personal branding. And the talk is about bring internal greatness out. And uh, Dr. Dr. Hasip will join us from Washington. Uh, so this will be very late for him, right? So the time we have kept is 7.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, India time. So if you want to join, get up early, get some exercise, and then attend this session at 7.30 in the morning. So over here you see 22nd April and over here you see 27th April. So it is not the deception guys, that's a typo. The session is next week, 22nd April, 7.30 AM India time. Great. So that's about the session. And as a tradition, we always do uh, the Wheel of Fortune and we give away Amazon Alexa. So this time we announced that we are not going to give away Amazon Alexa. So what do you guys think? Should we give it away? If, if yes, then type yes on the chat box. Let me see how many people are interested in getting the Alexa because we kind of keep it giving all the time. So iPhone, yes, may not be iPhone, but yes, Alexa could be there. Ah, yes for everyone, Pavanji, why not? So I, I have this wheel of fortune here and I am going to, oh, so many yes. So you guys are listening, that's good to know. Great, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin it again and we will pick one lucky winner. I will spin it only three times. If your name comes, great. If your name does not come, I'll keep the Alexa, okay? 
every time i say alexa my alexa over here start to say yes what to do okay i am running it now let's see who the lucky winner is going to be this time muthu krishna ji if you are there go to the chat and type yes so one time it is gone right this muthu is not there perfect so i am going to run it one more time the password is deception d e c e p t i o n okay i'm running it for second time now and this time it is sahadevan vijayan are you there if yes you... okay so you have to turn on your cam and show us that okay you are there and take out your aadhar card as well <laughs> no i'm just kidding okay so great um, uh, amazon alexa is gone so i will sync offline with you and we will have it delivered so dominic that's how we run our show thanks a lot thanks for joining in and sharing your knowledge with us uh, thanks everyone for joining thank you thank you for having me thanks. i really bye. appreciate thank it thank you great session thank yeah. you thanks dominic thanks vikas for arranging this thank you bye bye thank you Thanks Jomin